Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming to this session. I, I, I think I saw a few of you in the morning session too. Thank you for coming again. Um, we are asked to introduce ourselves because there's no chairman or chair lady. Uh, my name is Farhang Jahanpur, a very easy name if you know Persian. Uh, I was born in Iran, but I'm a British national. I've lived here for nearly 50 years and have taught in this department for the past 33 years. So I know this very well. I wonder if you can close the door. Or you want it open? When I was asked to speak today, as you know, this is the 140th anniversary of the founding of the Department of Continuing Education, the oldest such department in Britain, and even before anything similar took place in America, which came a few years later. So it's quite a, a distinction to have the oldest Department of Continuing Education or Adult Education probably in the world. I thought it would be interesting to go back and look at the year 1878, which was the year when the department started, and look at the area of my expertise, which is the Middle East, and see what was going on in that part of the world at that time. Of course, 100, 140 years is a very short time in the history of nations, especially nations in the Middle East whose histories go back in millennia, whether it is Egypt or Iran or Syria or Iraq. These countries go back at least to 2000 or so BC. They have been there for a very, very long time. So 140 years is a very recent time. At that time, of course, Britain was a very different place from what it is today, too. Great deal has changed in this country. In 1878, Britain was at the height of her empire, the greatest and the mightiest of the time, ruling over a very large section of humanity, especially in the subcontinent and huge territories upon which the sun never set. In fact, in some ways, you can say that that period was a crescendo, the height of the empire. Let me give you a few statistics. In that year, in 1978, the Second Anglo-Afghan War was fought, which unlike the first one, ended in Britain's clear victory, and they created Afghanistan as a buffer between the jewel in the crowd, which was India, and of course the Russian Empire, which was trying to come down and encroach upon the Middle East. In 1878, again the same year, the tension between Britain and Russia in Europe ended with the June 1978 Congress of Berlin, which basically declared Britain as the uncontested power in Europe and in the Middle East. It was about the same time, a little earlier, when Queen Victoria officially took the title of Empress of India. Therefore, Britain was a different place from the present Britain. But so, of course, was the case about many of the Middle Eastern countries. Nowadays, we think of them as hotbeds of terrorism, chaos, destruction, wars. You'll be surprised to learn that these are recent phenomena. Even 140, 50 years ago, there still were some Middle Eastern empires, but as 
England was ascending, those countries were at the beginning of their long decline. In the case of my country, Iran, uh, the decline started after the fall of the Safavid Empire. <coughs> the Safavid Empire, which started in 1500, 1499, was the biggest Persian empire after the Arab conquest. At its height, it conquered, it, it had the whole of Iran, practically the whole of the Caucasus, including Georgia and Armenia, the whole of the present day Afghanistan, and most of Central Asia. And of course, a great deal modern Iraq and the Persian Gulf. But with the fall of the Safavids, and especially the rise of the Gajars right at the big end of the 18th century, Iran began to decline. By 1900, Iran was experiencing one disaster after another. Do you awfully mind if I sit down because I've got a bit of a backache and I've been standing a lot. I hope you can hear me. Um, Iran was facing Russia, the Russian Empire, which was a very aggressive empire at the time. They were coming down on both sides of the Caspian. They took a huge amount of territory on the east of the Caspian, which is Central Asian countries, which then later on became Soviet republics, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and so on. And they took a great chunk of the area in the west of the Caspian, which used to be part of Iran. And in order to stem the tide of Russian progress, Iran went into war with the Russians and in two disastrous agreements, treaties, the one in called Gulistan Treaty, in, signed in the Gulistan Palace in Tehran in 1813, and then the other one, Turkmenistan in 1827, Iran lost a huge amount of territory. As a result of the first one, the 1813, Iran lost what is now Dagestan, which is part of Russia, Eastern Georgia, most of the current Republic of Azerbaijan, and Northern Armenia. With the Treaty of Nakhchivan of Turkmen Chai, Iran lost all the rest of the South Caucasus, that came further down, Erevan, Nakhchivan, which is now a certain republic of its own attached to Azerbaijan, and Talish Khanids. So a huge chunk of the area which is east and west of the Caspian Sea were lost as a result of those disastrous wars with Russia. I apologize. No, okay, India at the time, of course, contrary to what people think, I think majority of people don't really realize, India was not a poverty-stricken country when Britain went there. Let me just give you a few statistics. Um, in the 17th century, when Britain was beginning to the East India Company and the British influence in India, India was the world's largest economic power. It produced 24.4%, it owned 24.4% of the world GDP. So a quarter of the wealth of the whole world was in India. And it was the leader in manufacturing products of nearly a quarter. What America was a few decades ago, India was then. A quarter of manufactured goods in the world were produced in India. The Mughals, which came to power at the beginning of the 16th century with the help of the Safavids, they supported them to go and take over India. They ruled over more than 150 million people and the biggest economy in the world. However, of course, with the coming of Britain, gradually the whole thing went and collapsed. And, and as I said, by 1876, Queen Victoria became the officially Empress of India. Uh, in 1858, 
India was officially taken over as part of the British government rather than the East India Company. Apart from Iran, which went through this very sudden rather collapse of defeat at the hand of the Russians, but again in Iran it also gave rise to a reform movement. The very first military reform movements in Iran started shortly after the Turkan Tri Treaty, when Iranian military forces were reorganized. Uh, and by 1850, at the time of a very progressive <coughs> Iranian prime minister, Iran had its first, in 1850, University of Technology, Darul Funun, which is still going on. It initiated a lot of administrative change in the country. Sadly, it didn't last long. The king took, became jealous of him and put him to death a few years later. But the movement started. And in 1905, Iran was the first country in the Middle East to have a constitutional revolution which culminated in a parliament which limited the power of the kings and there was a constitutional rule taking over the country. Now, a similar kind of thing happened in the Ottoman Empire. Um, let me show you these, which I have. Ottoman Empire, of course, goes a very long way back. Um, Ten seventy one was when the Seljuks were defeated the Byzantines, the Eastern Christian empire basically fell and that is normally taken at the beginning of the rise of the Ottoman Empire. So as you can see it's a long long time ago and it was one of the longest lasting empires in the Middle East and in the world. In 1288 we have the beginning of the rise of the empire when Uthman, Uthman, the Arabic pronunciation of it, Uthman Lu, the Ottomans, comes from his name, began a period of expansion by about 1280. Bursa in northwestern Anatolia was captured, and it also saw the de defeat of the Bayezid by Taimur in Ankara. Then we have the period of 1328, where we have the rise of the empire under Mehmed I and Murad II from 1413 to 1451. We have the Mehmed II and Murad II, which I just mentioned, and then goes on to the period of resting Thessalonica from Venice, defeating a Christian counteroffensive by Yanan Huyandi. I'm just going through them very quickly to come to the period of decline. In 1453, the most important event happened in many ways, when Constantine, which was the seat of the Eastern Roman Caliphate and the center of the Byzantine Empire, which sadly had been weakened by the Crusaders who were going towards the Holy Land, but in the way they began to massacre Jews and people and basically undermined and destroyed the Byzantine Empire. By 1453, it had become too weak and it fell to the Ottomans, to Mehmet, Sultan Mehmet, which is called Mehmet Fateh, Mehmet the Conqueror. And that was the beginning of the rise of the Ottomans and expansion within Europe proper. They crossed the Bosphorus and they came to Europe and Constantinople, which for many centuries had been the center of the Byzantine Empire, became in fact the capital of the Ottomans. Then in 18, 1459 you have the conquest of Serbia. In 1461 you have the conquest of Trebizond which was the last, last Christian state in the East. In 1463, you have the conquest of Bosnia. In 1468, you have the conquest of Moria and Albania. In 1504, 
you have the conquest of Romanian principalities. So as you can see, it began to expand practically throughout Eastern Europe. The heyday of empire, you can say, came with the Battle of Chalderon because they were not only fighting the West, they were also fighting the rising power of the Safavids in Iran, and that is really what in many ways saved the West from further encroachment of the Ottomans. It kept them back because they had to fight on both frontiers with Iran, and they reached the Battle of Chalderon in 1514, uh, which went against Iran, and a temporary occupation of Tabriz, the capital of Iranian Azerbaijan, in 1514. Uh, in 1516-17, armies of Sultan Salim I capture Syria, Palestine, Egypt, mo Muslim holy places in Arabia, with the conquest of Egypt, which was the last remnant of the Islamic Caliphate, after the Abbasids, the remnants of them, went there and formed a Shi a caliphate in Egypt, the Fatimids. And with the conquest of the Fatimids, the Sultan became the Caliph. So this was another important date in the history of the Ottoman rise, 1516, which was not only the ruler, the king, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, but also the Caliph of all Muslims with control over the Muslim holy places in Mecca and Medina. In 1520, conquest of Belgrade. 1522, conquest of Rhodes. As you can see, a continuous period of conquest of territories, mainly in Europe, at the expense of European powers. 1526, conquest of Hungary. 1529, conquest of Algeria. 1534, Iraq was captured which was part of Iran, more or less, and a part of it fell. There was called Iraq Ajam and Iraq Arab, the Arab Iraq and the Persian Iraq. The eastern part and the southern part of Iraq, which were mainly Shi'is, Karbala, Najaf, uh, remained part of Iranian sphere of influence, while the rest of it, Baghdad and especially the north, became part of the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire. Uh, they took Basra, Kuwait, Bahrain, in 1554. Uh, Tunisia was captured in 1535. Albania was captured in 1538. North Africa, Tripoli, uh, Bougie, Jerba were conquered from 1551 to 60. Malta was captured in 1567. Cyprus was captured in 1570. Um, but in this period of rapid growth and expansion, began to be halted and came to a standstill and then paved the way for the decline. A very important date, marking the end of the rise of the Ottoman Empire and the beginning of the decline was 1683, which was the failure of the second siege of Vienna. They twice they said laid siege to Vienna. They nearly took it, but they lost. They, they could not. And one of the reasons was that the Sultan was always at the head of his army. And they would have to fight and come from Istanbul and then withdraw for the very cold winter in the Ottoman Empire uh, to be back again in the capital. And so their invasions were sort of like a flood going out and coming back again. And they stayed for a while around Vienna, but they couldn't take it. So they withdrew. But this really marked the beginning of the decline of the Ottomans in 1683. 1699, we have the Peace of Karlovich, where Sultan relinquished Hungary. Now, from now on, you see beginning of the territories which had been conquered to be given back either independently or be given back to various European powers. In 1774, we have Kuchuk. Kainarja Treaty with Russia after a major defeat at the hand of the Russians at sea and on land. Um, then we have 1789, exactly the same thing which happened in Iran. When the defeat comes, they began to look for the reasons for the defeat and for failure. 
So we have the beginning of serious movement. I've just come to this, uh, and that's the main part of what I want to talk about. The Tenzimat, which means order, regulation, reforms. That was the beginning of the reform movement under the Ottomans. To add insult to injury, we get the beginning of the rise of Europe. In fact, if you like, the colonization of the Middle East, the subjugation of the Middle East by the West, dates from the very end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, 1798, when Napoleon conquered Egypt. It came as a terrible shock. They had no idea who the hell is this upstart coming from France, nobody had heard of him, comes and takes a major Islamic city, which was the heart of the Fatimid Empire. So this really was the beginning of the slope, the sudden uh, expansion of Europe and the defeat and retrenchment of the Middle Eastern countries. Um, 1830, the French took Algeria, uh, which of course they kept on until the very bloody wars of, Indian, uh, of Algerian independence where more than a million were killed and they had to give it up under the goal. 1876, the first Ottoman constitution was written under Tenzimat by Mehmet Pasha. 1881, Tunisia was lost. 1882, Egypt was lost when Britain became the overlords in Egypt. 1908, the Young Turk Revolution started, which began to go against the whole concept of Ottomanism and empire. And then we have 1912 to 1913, the Balkan Wars, which began to end very badly for the Ottoman Empire. And we have the rise, the end of the Caliphate in 1922, and the independence of Turkey as a nation state rather than as an empire after the major defeat in the First World War. For many decades, Turkey was regarded as the sick man of Europe. And as you can see, bits of it began to be taken away. And of course, after the First World War, the whole empire was destroyed and took over. So what was the Turkish reform like, the Tenzimat? The Tenzimat began not with the intention of transforming the society, but of modernizing it, reforming it, consolidating the Ottoman power within the territories without the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it was characterized by various efforts from different sultans, and bits of it were added to it. Uh, it began to integrate non-Turkic, because there were lots of Christians, Arabs, uh, Armenians, Jews, and <coughs> others in the Ottoman Empire. And they wanted to integrate them within the Ottoman society, as I said, with the end of the so-called Ottoman Empire and the power that it had. Some very important reforms were initiated during this period, during the 10, 20 year period. They really began to change society and it became something quite different from what it had been prior to the Tenzimot. Uh, for a start, they started a regular army with regular conscription rather than Devshirme, which was the old system of selecting people from mainly Christian backgrounds and training them for the army. It became a universal conscription and a new form of army. You may be surprised to learn that officially same-sex activity was legalized in 1858 long before anything like that in Europe or in the West. Although people in same-sex relationships were not given the full protection of the law as the heterosexual um, couples. But at least it was legalized and people could openly be homosexual. Uh, the motto of the Tenzimat was, and I quote, Muslim and non-Muslim, Turkish and Greek, Armenian and Jewish, Kurd and Arab are the citizens, equal citizens of Turkey with its equal rights. Therefore, instead of the idea of the empire, especially very much the 
caliphate based on the Sharia, that began to go in favor of a national state with modern nationalistic aspirations and characteristics. So that regardless of who you were, this was again way before we really had any kind of similar form of tolerance in other parts of the world. They called the Millat system. It just started even under the Ottomans and then was developed. So that Christians, the Armenians were one Millat. European Catholic Christians were another Millat. The Jews were another Millat. And so on. So that Millat mean, meant a community completely recognized with rights within the Ottoman Empire and of course now within the Ottoman state without the empire. On November 3, 1839 is the starting date of the Tenzimat by Abdul Majid I when he issued what they call the Khat Sharif, the royal decree, the noble decree literally, uh, the edict of Gulkhane. Gulkhane is a Persian word which means rose garden or rose house. Uh, so it was issued from Gulkhane and then gradually added to it. And some of these reforms, as I said, were quite remarkable. It, for example, guaranteed to ensure Ottoman subjects the perfect security for their lives, honor, and property. 1839. It was the introduction of the first Ottoman paper banknotes, 1840. We have the reorganization of the financial system and the reform of the banking system in 1840. We have the reorganization of the civil and criminal code again in 1840. The establishment of what they called Majlis <coughs> Ma'arif <coughs> which was a kind of prototype of the Majlis of Shura, which is a consultative assembly, which became later the first parliament, which was formed in 1876. Uh, you have the first national identity card. So, regardless of who, who you were, you had an identity card. You became a member of the state, and this gave you the security of being, first of all, known, and then all the rights and privileges of being a subject of the Ottoman uh, system. That was 1841. Uh, I'm sorry, 1844. Uh, the institution of public education instruction, 1845, and the Ministry of Education to provide secular education to all the children throughout the Ottoman area in 1857. A Ministry of Health in 1850, the establishment of the Academy of Sciences, 1851, and the official abolishing of the slavery in 1847 or any trade in slavery. So the new reforms were very, very important in many respects because first of all, they put an end to the Ottoman Empire. They tried to replace it with a modern state with all the characteristics of a modern European state, as I said, with all these different laws. Everybody is a subject of the state on the basis of being, regardless of your race, religion, nationality, you become a member of the state. <coughs> what is more important is something which is not quite realized in the West. Of course, it came to a head under Ataturk, but it really started with the Tanzimat. The orientation of the society changed. Because for centuries, especially since the Sultan became the Caliph of the Muslims, the basis of the governance was the Sharia and the Islamic law. He was the protector of Islam and the Islamic Sharia. With the re regime of the Tanzimat, that really puts the end of the religious period and the beginning of a secular period. So that instead of looking to the divine writ and the Holy Quran, the parliament begins to make laws. This is a major, major shift. So that instead of saying that the law comes from above, from divine sources, and you have to follow, 
the law is something which people make through their representatives in the parliament. Another very important change, which again we talk about it simply, but I mean if you really look at the changes that took place about emancipation of women or the reforms that we have had in this country, instead of having the divine law and the sharia suddenly going to a secular law, civil courts, judges who would sit and decide on the basis of the laws. King Sultan Suleiman is known in the West as Suleiman the Magnificent because of the magnificence of his court. In the Islamic world and in Turkey, he is known as Suleiman Qanuni, the lawgiver, because under him a whole establishment was, was created to write new laws mainly based on Napoleonic uh, uh, code and civil codes, secular codes nothing to do with Islam, sometimes trying to give it some sort of compatibility with Islam, but the emphasis much more on the secular aspect and the man-made aspect rather than on the divine aspect. So you have the whole religious, legalistic, educational worldview changing from what was before a very much Islamic-oriented, Sharia-based outlook to a much more Europeanized, modern secular outlook, which then continued. With Ataturk, he went and the Reza Shah exactly about the same time in Iran. Iran, as I said probably in the morning some we heard, was the first country in the Middle East to have a proper constitutional revolution in 1905. The Ottoman uh, constitutional revolution came in 1908, uh, where the parliament became supreme and the power of the king was removed. He became a uh, a sort of, not a ruler, he reigned rather than ruled. He became a monarch rather than being head of the government. And that was a major, major change, both in the Ottoman Empire and in Iran under the constitutional movement. But with Ataturk and with Reza Shah, they did something which even here would be quite revolutionary. He changed people's looks you had to wear a different kind of costume, which was mainly European with the Ottoman hat, so that you looked more European. One thing which he did, which almost was comical, and of course at first was resisted, but he pushed it. As you know, in Europe too, for a very long time, many centuries, the Bible was always read in Latin. Majority of people went there and just, you know, nodded, and it was nice because it gave it some sort of aura. You don't understand what you are read, but the cleric knows, and you just listen to it. <coughs> when I was in Isfahan in Iran during the revolution, this was one of the major tactics of the mullahs. They would go on the pulpit and recite for five, ten minutes verses from the Quran in a very sonorous voice. People are mesmerized. There's something in the divine language which is coming down. And then, of course, what he says is built on that and sort of gains the power of the word of God in a way. And so you can brainwash the public. Now, all the texts, both in Iran and in Ottoman Empire, was read in, in the, your prayers was said in, in Arabic. The majority of people did not understand it. The sermons were given in Arabic. The Quran was read in Arabic, at least the sermons given with the Arabic uh, verses. And then, of course, he spoke in Turkish or Persian. Ataturk ordered that people should not read Arabic. He first of all changed the script from the Arabic to a Latin transcript. Just imagine if tomorrow they say that English should be written in Arabic often. <laughs> <laughs> and all the books are changed. Overnight it renders the entire population illiterate. Because you can't read whatever is written in the new language. You have to learn a new language, and the books which are, which are not changed into the new script, basically, and this is what has happened in Turkey, unfortunately, majority of Turks right up to the present time are alien to their history of a thousand years past, because they can't read those texts. Sorry, it, it's too hot? Yes. We can open it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this was a very important change which meant it suddenly eroded the power of the clerics. 
it destroyed the mystique of Islam and the Quran and the Holy Writ. And you have to translate quickly the Azan, the call to prayer, or the Quran, or the verses into vernacular in very bad form, not like the King James's version. <laughs> and then you suddenly go and stop saying, Allah Akbar, you begin to say it in Turkish, rush to the prayers, rush to the prayers, God is great, God is... It almost made a mockery of religion. And of course this was his intention, to undermine the power of the clerics. In Iran, Reza Shah defrocked all the clerics. He said, you can't just be cleric because you have gone and studied some theology somewhere. You have to go to university and study theology. So that people had to start all over again. All the clerics, Ayatollahs and so on, were abolished. And more or less not quite to the same extent in Turkey because it pushed, pulled the rug from under their feet. They can't speak now in Arabic. They can't read the verses in Arabic. They have to speak in the vernacular. They have to read the Quran in the vernacular. They have to say the Azan in the vernacular. <coughs> Reza Shah by force took the veil, not only the, the garb which we are debating in this society today, but a scarf in Iran people could not wear under Reza Shah in, 80, in 1932. He abolished the veil and if any woman was seen in the street with a veil, the police would come and pull it from their head. Again, to get the enormity of it, imagine, I'm not making a joke, it really is a fact. If all women are required from tomorrow to go with burqa in the streets, and that's the same way it. You totally change the way that people dress, the way they wear, the way they think, the way they behave, the way they speak, the way they worship. My father, at the time of Reza Shah in, in 1932, was in Shiraz. Reza Shah had come for a visit. He saw with his own eyes the Shah's cavalcade was coming. Suddenly a dog appeared in front of him. And the police, get, 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 don't worry. And then at the same time, a cleric with a turban appeared from the other street. The officer shouted, forget the dog, go and get him out of the way. <laughs> there was this kind of fanaticism against any symbol of religion and religiosity, both in Iran and Turkey for a short time. After Reza Shah went, his son Mohammed Reza Shah relaxed those rules and people could wear again chalur and whatever, uh, scarf, <coughs> hijab. But the same thing more or less happened in Turkey. In a way, you can see what we are witnessing today is a reaction to that period of very fast secularization and the anti-religious move. The societies have had to go through this period. When you go to one extreme, the society puts you back. And so after Ataturk, again, we get the coming of Islam. Again, they are allowed to read the Quran in Arabic again to say the Azan in Arabic, and so on. And after Reza Shah went, again the people began to wear hijab. Although it did not become very public. In Iran, when I was teaching at Isfahan University just before the revolution, honestly, I'm not exaggerating. You could not find one single student in the university who would uh, wear a hijab or a scarf. Because it was old-fashioned. Women would not wear it. The year before the revolution, it became a sign of protest. It became a uniform. The girls who were ashamed to put it on in the street, in the roads, would put it in their bag, come to the university gate, and then put it on coming as a protest to say that, you know, I want to be Islamic against the Shah and against the reforms. So what we see today is a pushback, at least what we saw in the Islamic revolution. And I think what we are seeing under uh, the present uh, Erdogan, uh, the Turkish president, is a pushback against that rather extreme and abrupt secularization. Um, I was going to say that out of all these empires, the Persian Empire, the uh, Mughal Empire, the Ottoman Empire, they did okay because, I mean, they managed to shed the empire and become more or less citizens of a state like Turkey, like Iran, like India. 
I was going to say that Britain has done the best because from having the greatest empire after the Second World War when all the colonies began to fall apart and India was given its independence, Britain came to terms with it. It became a modern society. Whether Brexit is a symptom of that, <laughs> whether we are still trying to adjust to this enormous change which has taken place, whether the rise of extreme right nationalism in Europe is some sort of a reaction to the loss of Austro-Hungarian Empire or whatever. These are big debates which we'll have to talk about and think about in the future. But um, uh, it's interesting to look back and see that that's what 140, 50 years, enormous changes have happened. Big empires have collapsed. Societies have undergone fundamental change and they are still in the process of adjusting to these enormous changes. When Nixon went to see uh, Chairman Mao, apparently he asked him, what do you think about the French Revolution? And Mao said, it is a bit too early to decide. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good point. Um, we need a bit of perspective. We need a bit of detachment and separation from the events to look back and see what happened? What is going on? What's, what the hell is going on in America under Trump? Mm -hmm. What is happening in Europe? What is the rise of the far right and populist movements in Europe? So there are a lot of questions which if you just take your view back a bit and look at a longer period, probably they make a bit more sense. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because of my age and as I said, I've got my backache, mm -hmm. I will not be teaching any courses this term, but there are three Middle Eastern courses there is one, a day school, which I always used to run, but now uh, my friend Garrett has been uh, organizing it this year. Again, on my birthday, which I won't be coming, 22nd of September, <laughs> is uh, the day school on the Middle East, a very, very good program of lectures. Again, here at Ruby House. If you haven't registered, I think it would be worthwhile. Turkey and the Middle East, again by Garrett, will be teaching a course. Uh, 10 Thursday afternoon starting on 24th of January and Israel and Palestine weekly classes. I'm told that it is full in October but you can register for from 8 April onwards. So there are courses going on. There's a day school on the Middle East. Sadly or fortunately for you, you won't see me. Uh, maybe hopefully next summer again I'll come to you some lectures. Thank you very much. Well, again, we have about 10 minutes, if anybody has got, yes, please.